Raymond asks, how can you tell if you have a thermocouple or RTD just by looking at them? Ah, that's a good one, Ray. That's a very good one. Generally speaking, all thermocouples will be two wires. RTDs can be two, four, or three wire. Generally speaking, they are three wire. But they do have two and four wire, so you need to be a little careful there. And uh, thermocouples generally will have uh, two odd color wires, let me be it red and white. With an RTD, also, it's just like red, red, and white if it's a free wire. Right. You know, another real quick check there, too, is with an ohm meter. And just check between the, the two lead wires. And at room temperature, RTDs are going to read about 109 or 110 ohms. And another way, if you can see the end of the wire itself, the thermocouple will have the two wires twisted together, and then it'll be a small weld on the very end of it. Of course, an RTD will always be inside a sheath. Right. OK, um, we have a question from Barbara. You mentioned bearings. And in my office, they usually specify RTDs for fan bearings as opposed to thermocouples. Uh, for this application, is there an advantage to using RTDs for thermocouples? Oh, well, um, you know, it really would depend on the configuration of the bearing. And if you're trying to, to measure the actual journal temperature or if it's uh, a bearing that's in an oil bath, for example. <coughs> Sometimes, because of the, the thermocouple can be made very tip sensitive, and you're trying to just measure you know, maybe a pillow block or the, the bearing journal, that can be a more accurate measurement. And so it really depends on the details of the installation. Mm -hmm. Generally okay. speaking, would you agree, Bill, that we're looking at RTDs for that because we're well within that temperature range of the RTD? Well, that's where I would start looking first, and 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 to see how you know what what kinds of you know what the, the connection is like, and and where we can put the um, you know whether there's there's a access hole drilled into a pillow block where you can get some immersion length for an RTD to sit, you know, then, then that could be a good choice. Yeah, and it, it does come back down to if it's a special application, then you have to take that into consideration. But right. generally speaking, I would believe an RTD would be a best choice. OK. Um, Daryl asks, what is the maximum acceptable gap between a thermal well end and a, a thermocoupler RTD? You know, typically we try to get the tip of the sensor planted firmly at the bottom of the well using a spring to uh, put about you know, it's roughly three pounds of pressure on it, just enough to hold it in place. It does a couple things. One is it has a little better heat transfer between the well and the sensor. The other thing is that if there's any vibration going on, having that sensor firmly planted at the bottom of the well keeps it from rattling around inside that bore. And that can destroy an RTD pretty quickly. A thermocouple, not quite as quick, but it's, it's certainly not good for it. And we do offer a heat transfer grease that you can put down into a thermal well if your probe does not touch the bottom of that thermal well. But uh, that would be like secondary. Number one would like to be able to make that, that contact. But if you can't, we do offer a heat transfer grease. OK. Uh, we have a question from Jefferson. Um, we calibrate thermocouples annually. And this is a pharmaceutical application. Is this frequency OK? And secondly, please repeat or clarify your recent comment about thermocouples not being able to be calibrated. Well, uh, the, the accuracy of the thermocouple is affected by the, the lead wire that it's connected to. And if you have a, a long run of wire and you're going through a terminal block and you know maybe some kind of control system or an indicator of some kind, those can all have an effect on its ultimate accuracy. And as soon as you disconnect that thermocouple from that system, you've changed the accuracy uh, that, it, that it's going to, in fact, it's changed the voltage characteristics 
that you're going to measure, like if you take it back to a lab and measure it, you know, if it's a real short run of lead wires where you've just got, you know, you know, maybe a foot or so, not as big a deal. And then and you can, you know, take it back and, and calibrate it in a regular calibration bath and, and do it that way. But it, it's typically not a very good practice to do that. Okay. And I believe another part of that question was how does it hurt an RTD or a thermocouple to be calibrated? And the answer to that is no. It does not. It's a good process. Oh, you know, and the, the timing on that, too. Uh, you know, a, a thermocouple doing just an annual calibration, I guess I would not be comfortable with that. You know, it would really depend on the, you know, the accuracy that you're trying to get out of that measurement point. And also just your, you know, the comfort level of, knowing with some confidence what your process is doing at that particular location. Okay, we have a question from Roel. How does a three-wire RTD operate? Well, the, the, the three wires are there to compensate for the lead wire resistance. Because when you're measuring it, you want the resistance of only that platinum resistor. Most of these have two red leads and one white lead connected to them. And what the control system or a transmitter or whatever signal conditioner you have connected to it, it will read the resistance of those two red leads and then subtract what it sees between the white lead and the red lead. And that way you're left with just the resistance of that sensing element. You know, since it's a real kind of a... Uh, a simple way of looking at it. Electrically, that's not exactly what's happening, but um, the end result is that you're measuring just the resistance of that sensing element. Okay, guys, we, we actually have a lot of questions. I don't believe we're going to be able to get to all of them because we're, we've, we're sort of running out of time here. Uh, but I do want to let everybody know that we are available to answer your questions offline if we didn't get to them. Um, we see our contact information is on the screen. We're going to send a follow-up email, and there's going to be a, a recording of the webinar. And it's also going to, we're going to have Harold's and, and my contact information. If you have further questions, Industrial Controls has a full staff that can that can uh, answer your question one-on-one. -on -one. So feel free to contact us and you know take this discussion further. Um, I just want also wanted to let people know that uh, coming up March 24th, we're going to be broadcasting our first of a series of four webinars on pneumatic control systems, and it's going to be uh, we're going to have three more conducted in April, May, and June. Um, we're going to have a, an expert from Industrial Controls, and and we're also going to have experts from Johnson and Honeywell. Um, so we're going to send out some invitations to those coming up, and you can you can see what other webinars we have available on our website. Um, so at this time, I'd like to thank both presenters for your for your uh, information today, and um, we're going to call it uh, to an end. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yep, thanks for joining us.